Imagine that each morning when you wake up, you're smiling and looking forward to your day, knowing that you're happy even while dealing with grief and loss. The Grief and Happiness Podcast inspires, comforts, and supports you with each new episode. For more support, check out the Grief and Happiness Handbook and Cards. I welcome you to listen to this podcast and discover endless possibilities for your life. Physics says energy can neither be created nor destroyed. I believe my mother follows the same rules. She's lost to me in body, but I find her spirit inhabiting those around me. I am grateful for her kindness when it is given to me. I appreciate her gentleness when someone treats me gently. I admire her courage when I watch others be courageous. She is everywhere when I allow myself to see her. When I open myself to her, she pours in. My mother grants me an audience every time I catch my reflection. She escapes through my eyes, their shade reminiscent of the magnolia tree she planted. Her laughter hibernates in my throat, dormant until someone clever entertains her. She leaks from my fingertips, a tap of wisdom I welcome to overflow on my page. The words she mispronounced in my presence, I butcher with a new audience. During her passing, she molded me, shaping me into her earthly vessel. I'm her legacy, the incarnation of her life's work, her representative to life. Aloha. I'm so happy that you joined us today for a very special guest, Cleo Childs. She has approached dealing with grief in a different way that I I just love. I'm always talking about the arts and using the arts to help you with your grief. And what she has done is written poetry that's quite beautiful. So I I brought her on so that you could get to know her. And I know that you're going to want to listen to her poetry after you, you hear her just talk with us. So welcome. Hi, I'm so happy to be here. Could you tell us a, a little bit about your yourself, your journey, how you got to where we are right now? Yeah, so I'm Cleo Childs. I'm from Atlanta. So I the journey that I really have taken is with my mom. So when I was 21 years old, my mom got diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's. I lost her over the course of about six years. And then she died suddenly on Halloween of 2021. And I went through a period of deep isolation uh, and grief and that lasted for about six months. And then I, during that time, wrote. I didn't really write creatively, but I think it came relatively natural. My mother was an English major from the University of Georgia. And my grandmother, she was an English teacher and dealing the school system for 33 years. And she has a six years degree in English. I accidentally once called it a master's degree and she very, you know, rightly corrected me. She said, I went back for six years of English, not for four years. And I was like, oh, that's right. Okay. So she got a six years degree. And so I didn't ever wrote creatively, but I did come by writing poetry, I think relatively naturally. It was the only way that made sense for me to express myself because I went through intense, intense grief after losing my mother and writing and getting out of my body was really just the only way that made it hurt a little bit less. And so that's what I did. And I wrote in solitude for about two and a half years, just by myself and for myself. And then I got in contact with a record producer in Nashville who said he would produce me. And that was back in March. And then my album came out in May, mid-May. And now I'm here talking with you. So that's kind of been my journey. I love that. And I, I love how you're sharing that the poetry and the way it was recorded I think is really interesting too with the soundtracks behind it did you choose exactly which one of the it sounds like they're live while you're speaking is that right that's exactly right so it was really interesting the way that we did it I will be honest I come from a family of engineers from teachers, from English majors, we have a computer scientist, you know, and we don't have many artists within the family. We definitely don't have any musicians. And so the way that it was done to me was very novel and unique, but I, I don't know. My producer was amazing and put it together. My producer put together, his name is Jim Riley. He's amazing. Jim Riley, he put together a group of amazing musicians. And what we did is we went into the studio. I had my 
poems. I printed them out for everyone. There was five amazing musicians. And then I went into the booth and I would just said my favorite, I would say like, this is the feeling that I went through right here. This is where it shifts. My favorite sentence I ever said in the recording, I was like, this is about disillusionment with God. And they're like, okay. <laughs> and then they went and they really got together and they're like, I wonder what disillusionment with God meant. What does that sound like? And they're like, well, I think it's a little bit deeper. So we're going to take these musicians out and just keep these instruments. And then they improv And so they created what the soundtrack was on the spot. And then I would listen to it. And then I, we would record and I would just come in when I felt natural or where it felt okay for me. We did everything in one or two takes. If it was a second take, it was through me fumbling over my words, not through any them doing anything else. And they were very kind and gracious. And we got it all done in about two to three hours, which I don't know if that's normal or not. That's just the way that we did it. And it just really worked for us. And I'm glad that it worked out and it came out sounding really nice on the album. I'm not sure that there's a, a normal to compare it to with what you're doing because I think it's it's unique. I've always been amazed with how musicians can do improv. I've got lots of musicians in my family, especially jazz. Jazz is a large percentage improv. And I'm always just amazed that you can get different people and different instruments together and they get out exactly what they wanted to get out together. And it's it's not like they're talking about, well, can can you play this louder here? Or what about this note? It's not like that at all. They just play. The reason I thought that they were doing it live is because from poem to poem, the, the instrumentation's different. And usually in a situation like this, you'd probably, for instance, have a piano or a guitar in the background, and that would be it for the whole album. So it's very interesting to hear the different instruments, because to me, they're portraying different feelings, different atmosphere for the poem that you're reading. And they just it seems so attuned to that. I, I think they probably really enjoyed the opportunity to do this album and that comes through and and how the album sounds it's it's really cool oh thank you that's very kind i had a ball i'm a big person who really likes thank you notes i love stationery it's one of the things i got from my mom and so i wrote them all thank you notes afterwards and i really one of the things i just want to thank them for is for making it so easy it was a very easy day it was a very joyful day honestly i know that we were talking about grief but when i look back on it i was really nervous coming into it i didn't know i was going to nashville and i was going to like do a record and they were just so nice and kind and i felt welcomed right at home and i think that it was definitely a collaboration it was the the way that i say it and what i went and i told them when we went into it, that I wrote the words, this is no longer my project. This is our project that we're working on because it is something that I've brought in, but we're creating the album. And so I made sure to talk about that at the very beginning because I, it was really important to me that their contributions are seen as being as equal to mine because it's it's a two part when it comes to the album. There are the words, which I did, and I did the vocals or I did the the speaking part of it. But they created a beautiful instrumentational bed to lay it on. And we really just went through. And I, the way that, as I said earlier, was just every, as you're to your point though, every track I went through and I explained what the emotions were of us feeling it, you know, and we went through, I said, this is about parenthood. This is about motherhood. This is about being a mother. This is about me losing my mother. I am very happy here. This is where it changes in my head to where I kind of lose her. This is the first time. And so they were also able to bring in to each of the track, the different emotions uh, that I was feeling as I was feeling them or when I was writing them and to change it so that the instrumentation and the music directly related to the feelings that I had when I was in the poem. Because sometimes the emotions would change within the poems themselves and they were did a beautiful, wonderful, amazing job of being able to have it even within the poems be able to change up the way that the music was done. But yeah, my favorite, my favorite moment that day was just going, this is about disillusionment with God. And they're like, okay. <laughs> and I just thought that was so wonderful that they just figured out how to make dis like what is dissolute. And like I, I remember it was so lovely as I went, this is about bitterness you know, and they were like, okay, well, we're just going to make bitterness sound. And they made it sound like bitterness about disillusionment with God, which I just think is a masterclass and a testament to their ability as musicians. 
Yes, <laughs> I agree. It, it just it was really astonishing listening to it. I, I really enjoyed the art of the album. It, it really wonderful. I remember one thing in particular was it was like a drummer had a punctuated with his cymbal. It was kind of a soft sound, but it was like he was punctuating what you said. And I thought, oh, golly, these these musicians get this. It must have taken them forever to work on this and get it so perfect. And it, I'm mean, just tickled to hear that it didn't, that they just felt it and were able to do it so beautifully. Yeah, no, they absolutely did. And I really am just so grateful for each of them because they each brought it themselves into the project. I when I write little notes about it, I always say that, you know, many amazing and talented people put a lot of care, passion, and heart into this project. And what I'm really talking about are not only the editors, who I have three amazing editors that I'm very, very grateful for who helped me with the words, but the musicians helped to be able to bring their care, their heart, and their passion into the music of it. I mean, I took flute for six years. I was second chair all the time, only because there were two chairs and I was not very good. So I was given second chair. My my mother and my aunt both did music. They My mother played the clarinet and my aunt played the flute. So one of the things that you'll see was really important to me when I was picking out, I didn't, I didn't pick out many of the instruments. My producer, Jim, did all of that and found all the, uh, the amazing musicians. The one thing I asked for is I wanted to have a clarinet in it. I wanted to have woodwinds because my mother played the clarinet. And I wanted to have my mother's instrument on the album. And so we were able to have the woodwinds in it. You know, my mother played the oboe and she played the clarinet. And so that was really the only instrument that I was picky on was I wanted that sound because I wanted to have my mother's instrument on the album. And I'm very pleased to say we had a wonderful, wonderful musician come in and be able to you know, bring soul to that. But the musicians are just fantastic. But yeah, if we we did everything in one take, we did it with two. It wasn't because of them. It was absolutely because of me fumbling over my words. And I had to go back and say, oh, that's not how we say that. You know, we need to enunciate everything. And so, but they were just, I mean, top of the class. You could not ask for better musicians. That's so wonderful. I love your story about the clarinet because I think that's really important. And I have a soft spot for clarinet. I also played flute for many years. and. My band director was an amazing, amazing director. He he got us opportunities that nobody else got. Like we marched in the Rose Parade. He was that level that he could make that sort of thing happen. And he he played clarinet. So I, I have a kind of a different feeling toward that instrument. But I always sitting in, in the band, we played in the fall, we would do football music and halftime shows and that sort of thing. And then spring, it was all concert music that we do with competitions and, and things with. And so I had a real breadth of music experience. And I always used to think with with playing the flute, we, we sat in a in a way that is kind of a half circle with rows and this half circle and flutes were always right in the front. And I was kind of in the front toward the middle. It was like the best seat in the house to me to get to hear all these different instruments and feel them. I had a baritone sax behind me that I had just that my whole body would vibrate when he was playing. It's like each of the instruments had a personality. It wasn't just the people who were in the band. It was the instruments themselves that spoken in different ways and different tones. And with your album, I was thinking, gee, those are the perfect instruments for for that poem and the way they used them. And I noticed the, the difference in instrumentation, that it wasn't just all the same. And it fits so well. It's just beautiful. That's a testament. I just want to give a shout out to my producer, Jim Riley, because Jim Riley is fantastic. I, I absolutely am so grateful for him. I adore him. He was the one who figured out what the instruments should sound like. I mean, he put all the instruments together. He picked out all the musicians. He put the instruments. The only thing I said is I would like a you know clarinet, please. Can I please have an oboe clarinet? And so it's really a testament to his ear. Definitely, is he knew that they would just sound well together. He was like, what do you think about this person? Or what do you think about this instrument? And I was like, uh, sure, that sounds great, Jim. Whatever you think, you know? And And, and, and it's really... He helped to, he led that entire project of putting all these amazing instruments together. So 
I'm just very, very grateful for it. It's definitely his ear that came out and it's definitely his ear that was able to see that they would meld together really well. And that's just the level of experience that he has. Tell me more about you and your poetry writing. So it sounds like this poetry came out of your circumstances then, but did, have you wrote poetry all along? No, the, the way that it happened is I was in grief. It was about November, December. My mom passed away on Halloween of 2021. And I was in the middle of the night and it was about 1.30 or 2. And I heard two lines in my head and I just went downstairs and I wrote them and then I wrote and it felt a little bit better. And then I continued to write and it felt a little bit better. And then I just kept writing because it was the only thing that made it feel better. It made it hurt less. I would say it was still hurting. There's nothing that stopped it hurting, but it made it hurt less. And I also think that it was incredibly important that it was outside of me. It was for the first time I was able to take all these emotions that I was going through in grief and I was able to look at them and kind of help to process them as well as be able to explain to people what was going on. As I said, I went through deep isolation for about six months. I didn't talk to anyone. I didn't do anything. And if I did do something, I would call someone up and say, this is what I'm feeling. I would read them a poem. And then I would say, that's all I have the energy for. Yeah. But I just wanted to let you know. And then I would hang up. The poems became my way to be able to communicate with the outside world. And it was also my way to be able to get the emotions that I was having inside of me, outside of me, so that I could be able to look at them and be able to make it hurt us. I started to, I mean, I've read poetry growing up. My grandmother made us memorize poems by Robert Frost and, you know, read poetry and everything like that. But it certainly was never anything that I took a knack for it. I think I took a knack for it as anything that I tried. And I literally just heard two lines in my head and I wrote them. I think also I hear the words and I just have the job of recording them. And so I hear what I'm supposed to write and then I write it down or I write down and I see what I wrote afterwards. So for me, it's very much comes outside of me and I'm just really the channel and the vessel for it is the way that I see it. It's definitely me, but at the same time, I don't consciously think this is what I'm going to write it kind of comes and then I write it down and then I say, oh, I guess I wrote this. And that's kind of the way that I write is it's not conscious. It's very unconscious or it's, or it's very auditory. That's fabulous. I I just love how you're expressing that because I think, especially in grief, we have experiences that we haven't had before. And I know I was, I was writing like crazy after I've had two husbands die. And after the second one died, I live in Hawaii. We had just moved here two years before he died because this is where he wanted to be. He had lived here many years before I knew him. When I didn't have him to talk to anymore, it was like, okay, now what do I do? And I'm also a writer. I've written several books and I have dealt with things through my writing. I taught writing at the university level for most of my career. and. I thought, I'm just going to write. I I think, let me see what happens. It wasn't to publish. It wasn't to write a book. It wasn't to share. It wasn't anything like that. But it just poured out. And I filled, I use those little, I call them composition books. I filled, I don't know how many of those. My son the other day was saying, I was saying something about my journal and trying to find something in one of my journals. And he was going, good luck, you know, because you've got so many, several bookcases full of journals. This is my little book that I keep everything in. And it's the same thing. It's almost impossible for me because I have like, I think at this point, 120 pages worth of writing that I've done in it. And I have absolutely no idea where anything is inside of it. And so I keep, I go, oh, I remember writing that and I have to go and flip through it and it takes me a a really long time to go find it because I can't remember where I put it inside or chronologically. I don't know where it is. And so I completely understand this idea about being able to write in composition books and having absolutely no idea where it is and trying to go find it. You're like, oh, I, I remember writing something like that. That would be really good for me to be able to find right now. And then having a very difficult time figuring out where that is. Yeah, I have uh, at least three bookshelves, probably a whole bookcase, if I put them all in the same bookcase of of journals. 
that are full. <laughs> a lot of them would just be nonsense to somebody else that they read them and go, what was she talking about? Or what was she thinking about? But it was, I wasn't writing for them. I was writing whatever came out for me. And it was so, it sounds kind of medical, but it was, it was therapeutic. It just felt so good to do it. There's one that I have that I wrote in a Costco. I remember writing in a Costco. And so at that point, I usually, I always like to hand write things. It's not edited. It's not on the album, but it's eat the cookie, have another piece of pie, gorge yourself on processed happiness. Your mother is dead. Nothing matters anymore. Least of all self-control. I rack on pounds, filling out my tiny frame. In the mirror, I stand before a gaunt skeleton with dehydrated eyes rattling in sunken sockets. I'm starving, denied her. My soul rejects happiness, regurgitates joy. My skin drapes off my bones. I'm starving. Only grief can I swallow. I was just in a Costco. And it's just, I don't know where it came from, but it was just being able to write. It was writing everywhere because it hurt. It made it hurt less. And I, when I was hurting, I was like, I'll just write. I'll see what happens or I'll hear it. And I was like, I need to write it really quick. And then I would go home and put it in my journal. But I think that writing is an or any kind of, I believe, creative pursuit of a way to be able to make it whatever makes it hurt less. And I think it has to, I found it to be really beneficial of when it, it's, I only do it for me. You know, was, this was never meant to be as, I never did it with the intention of making it public. I did it solely for the intention of being truthful and honest to myself and it made it hurt less and it helped with the processing. And I think that if I had done it with the intention, it would have been very different if I had done it with the intention of ever being public. And I think that it just happened to become that way. But I believe that by going and making it for me, it made it more universal in a certain perspective, I remember hearing something where someone said that the more specific you are to your own experience, the more universal it becomes. I forgot where I picked that up from, but I believe that by writing specifically for myself and to myself, it probably allowed it to be more universal and to connect with people more. If it's the same you know, rule that I picked up from, I believe it was another writer wrote that. Um, it might've been about a screenplay or something like that. Cause I like reading about screenplays and whatnot. But I mean, have you found that to be true when you write for yourself or when you that it becomes a more like a more universal experience and that people seem to connect to the work that you write for yourself more? Absolutely. I really believe it. With writing after Ron, my second husband who died, I was just writing for me where after Jacques died, I was writing gratitude because somebody told me to because I was I was not talking to hardly anybody and not really being social. And I did talk to a friend at one point and she said, you're dwelling on everything that's negative about what's happened to you. She goes, you got, got to flip that switch. I thought, well, that's easy for you to say. And <laughs> then I, I said, well, I'll try. And I started writing a gratitude list and I was shocked at what came out that I did have things to be grateful for because here I thought it was the end of the world. And so I, I started writing more and more. And the more I wrote just things to be grateful about, the more I wanted to write more about whatever it was that I wrote there. And so it just kind of mushroomed naturally out from that. So after Ron died, it was much easier for me to turn to writing and be able to write that. And I had a, a, a friend, a good friend who lost her husband suddenly, who she was much younger than I am, and her husband was too. And he just died one night, and I was so concerned for her. She was on the mainland, and I was in Hawaii. So I thought, I'm I'm just going to write her every week for a year. So she'd be getting this constant support from me through that first year. I found those things that I wrote, because I wrote something different. I, I Before I started, I made a list of it was actually more than 52 things because once I started writing about what could I address that you deal with in grief that, that would help her. And I was amazed at how long the list was. And then it was easy to write from there. And it not only gave her the 52 cards, but that gave me two books with 26 chapters in each because I was able to write a 
a chapter about each one of these notes. And that was not my intention to start off at all. It was just writing to help me. But the more I was helping me, I was seeing how what I was writing was helping others. It felt so good. It helped me deal with my grief to not feel like I was alone, which is a very common feeling to people. Like you said, you isolated yourself. Very common. And to be able to do something like this freed me from that sense of isolation. When it came down to the idea of publishing the work, it's terrifying, quite honestly. I don't know if you find the same thing. I find it absolutely terrifying. I wrote a poem and it was this idea of, I don't want to put a, a much better with poems than I actually am with it, like being able to speak, but putting you know my soul in a museum's display. I think I'd rather put my soul in a a deep within a mountain where invited few may enjoy it, something along the lines of that. But I think that for me, and I can't control what people think, and I can't control if it means anything to anyone else. All I can do is put it out there with the hope that for one person, and it's already done it for one person, thus I find it to be successful, is that they feel understood in their grief and they don't feel alone in it. Because I felt so alone in my grief when I was doing it, I thought, and I had no one really I could talk to. I must feel the only, I must be the only person that feels this way. I must be the only person that feels angry with God and, you know, mad and bitter and depressed and all of these emotions. And I wanted to look to someone to see how, who had been through it. And it was really hard for me to find that. And so what I hope to do with the album is to put it out there with the intent of Maybe it might mean someone to something and maybe someone could be able to say, oh, that's how I feel too. And then not feel so alone in the way that I did when I was going through it. Because I think that one of the things that I came across is this idea is it's really hard for people to talk about grief honestly. Because a lot of people, they try to go and placate grief. And they try to say, oh, it's too much. I think a lot of people's grief came across as being too much. And I felt too much for people. All my emotions were so much that I couldn't express them to people and have them listen because I felt like a burden. Like I felt like I was like passing like this giant ball of grief and letting someone else hold it to make me feel better. And so what I did instead was I write, I isolated myself and I wrote. And I really would hope with the album is someone can go and sit with it. And I wrote something along the lines of like, they can sit metaphorically and say, I understand you're not alone. I have found peace and acceptance and maybe you can too in time, right? It took me time to find peace and acceptance. I think that's the other thing is I saw all these people who were in grief that had already gone through it. And I thought, kept thinking, how in the hell am I going to go from being angry at God to feeling peace and acceptance? Like people said, And I couldn't see a path forward and the fact that how someone could do it. And so what I hope to do with the album is I arranged it in a very specific way. So you could see organically how the emotions shift over time from in one to the other so that they, you can understand how someone emotionally got from the depths of being disillusioned with God and angry with God about one situation and having peace and acceptance, which I do now. And to show that there is a path. And I think also when I call it moving with is it was came to me in a poem at the very end of my writing that there's no moving on. There's just moving with. I remember what was, I accept what is. And I think that you move with grief. And I think no one had told me that I thought you move on from grief. And I was kind of afraid of this idea as I didn't want to move on from my mom. I didn't want to lose her. I kind of felt like if I was in grief, I was being able to honor her rather than what I realized is that I will never move on. I just move with it. And my mom moves with me and I move with the loss of my mom and I move with her and I move with it. But yeah, it's just, I think putting one's work out there for me is terrifying, but I do it with the hope that maybe someone won't feel so alone in the way that I did. And that would be a success. That's beautiful. And that's exactly it. That's such a gift that that you're able to give to other people. Sometimes when they get that gift, they don't quite know what to do with it yet, but then it'll dawn on them, yeah, that's it. Because I know with me, I felt kind of the same way that I, I didn't, I felt like I would be giving up my husband's as opposed to 
being with them. Like I still write them letters. I do things like that. And I think I'll, I'll do that till I'm transition myself because I believe my belief is that when you grieve someone, you you're holding them in your heart and that they'll be there for the rest of your life. That's kind of the definition of of grief to me. Feeling that way, it, it just seems to go beyond that rest of your life that it's so comfortable to do it that way, where before I realized that when I thought it was something that I had, I had to follow the steps and get over it, you know, then that didn't work. And I was afraid of, lo- it felt like if I stopped grieving, then I would lose her. And I think that once I started to realize this idea that I had is I move with grief, is that I move with her. And I think, I, you know, the first track on the album is kind of an author's letter. And it's this idea I wrote very early on is she is with me. She leaks from my fingertips, a tap of wisdom. I welcome to overflow on my page. The words she mispronounced, I butcher with a new audience. And I realized that I am her, I am the legacy, the incarnation of her life's work, representative to life now. She lives through me. What I do and what I say is that what I try to encourage other people to do and what I try to do is my mother was a very kind person. And I, when I engage with kindness, I'm engaging with my mother because that's my mother's kindness coming out through me. I believe that I learned kindness from my mother and that when I am kind to people that I am loving my mother and that is my mother shining through me is through her kindness that she gave to me and that I learned from her and I'm now able to pass on. And so I feel like being kind, that was one of the things when I was going through grief, when I came out of it, I believe that I'm a kinder person than when I entered grief. And I think it's because I'm a softer person. I'm a more empathetic, more compassionate, but certainly a kinder person. But I realized because that's my way of connecting with my mother. Is by being kind to people, I can connect with her by being kind to myself and by being kind to others and by being kind to the world, then I can connect with my mom. And it's important to me to connect with her. And so I do that through being kind. That's beautiful. It's a fabulous gift. That kindness is, I think if the whole world was filled with kindness and gratitude, that we wouldn't be having wars. We wouldn't be having all this ridiculousness that's going on in our, our country right now. That's, to me, what life is all about is, is kindness and, and love and gratitude and paying attention to what you're experiencing. And I think what I realized is that kindness is a choice. I choose to be kind and I choose to have gratitude and I choose to engage with the lessons that my mother gave me. And I choose to engage with the best parts of her that she, I saw be enacted in front of me or not enacted, but I, I saw her, who her essence was. And I choose to engage with that part of my mother. And I choose then to become the vessel, her ambassador to life, her representation to life, because I choose to engage with her. Something I always assumed is that my mother was kind because of who she was. And it wasn't because of who she was. I think there is something of that, but she chose to be kind. And I choose to be kind. And I choose when I'm choosing it. It's an active choice. I actively engage with my mother. Well, this has been an amazing conversation. I'm so glad that we had the opportunity to have it. And I know that our listeners are going to get a lot out of this. And I encourage you to pay attention to the lessons here, the lessons of kindness and gratitude and of dealing with your grief through writing or another kind of art whatever it is, that it can really help you, support you in a way that nothing else does. So I'm, I hope you take this particular episode as inspiration to go out and take care of yourself. So thank you so much for being here with me today. And we will have all the, the links and information in the show notes so that you can find out how you can get a copy of this album because you're going to want to have it so be sure to to make note of that and i thank you all for listening and look forward to next week when we do this again do you want more comfort and support and happiness join the grief and happiness alliance at our free gatherings on zoom every sunday visit my website at griefandhappiness.com And read my books, The Grief and Happiness Handbook, and get your set of the beautiful Grief and Happiness cards. 
Be sure to subscribe to our podcast, rate it, review it, and binge listen to all of our episodes. I can't wait to welcome you back to another episode of the Grief and Happiness Podcast.